Thanks for listening to The Derivative. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. It is a second order derivative. Um, Lana is the change in delta per change in vol, per change in uh, implied in volatility. So, yeah. So as uh, implied volatility decreases by, I'm sorry, let's say increases by one, it's, it's the amount of deltas that, that change of your options position. Um, another important one that kind of goes hand in hand with it, which I talk a lot about, um, is charm. Charm is a bit more commonly looked at and used, but but still, you know, second order derivative. Um, that is per t- per change in time, um, so per amount of decay, call it right. How much your um, your delta changes as well. All right. Hello, everybody. We're back talking French baked goods today, because if you've been anywhere on VolTwit or FinTwit as of late, you've been hard pressed not to see the wide ranging and increasingly popular opinion of the vaguely mysterious handle at Jam Carson. And we've got the man behind the handle on today's pod, Jem Carson. See what he did there? Uh, who's founder and senior managing partner at Agia Capital Management. So we're excited to talk about some of our favorite uh, Twitter and non-Twitter topics with Jem, including volatility, retail call buying, growth versus value, just how complex trying to trade an uncertain election is and more. So welcome, Jem. Thanks for having me. Thanks for for being here. So it looks like you're in the office. Yeah. So uh, about two months ago, we got back in the office. uh, The other tenant we share space with uh, left, so we have twice the space and Perfect. We're all spread out, so it's uh, twice the space, half the price. Exactly. The um, and where are you? You you just mentioned off on your River North, to just north of the Loop here in Chicago. Yeah, four hundred one West Superior, so right uh, right in the heart of River North. Uh, easy commute for me from uh, Bucktown, so uh, you know. Perfect. So that's Superior and what LaSalle? No, Superior and Sedgwick, so just south of Chicago here, kind of right. In, yeah, 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 right in the heart. So cool. Um, so, uh, first question I alluded to in the intro there, your name is spelled C E M, but it's pronounced more like, uh, with a J gem, that's the handle. So give us yeah, the background on the name and the pronunciation. Yeah, it's Turkish. Uh, I was born in London, lived in Turkey as a, as a child, uh, grew up speaking Turkish English at the same time and then moved to Texas. And as you might imagine, that's quite a, uh, quite a change, um, you know, from Istanbul to, uh, to, to Houston. But uh, so people had a hard, <laughs> people had a hard time with it. Uh, so I get all kinds of uh, Jam, Jim, Jim Bob, Joey, Jeff, to respond to anything at this point. So uh, I figured the handle Jam Croissant might help clear that up. Uh, that's kind of a joke that's come around. My wife's last name is Barry, actually. So we're kind of the Jam Barry Croissants. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So her, her middle name's Barry and her last name's Carson, and you can. Uh, well, her last name is Barry, but she you know, she hyphenated it. Uh, Barry, uh, so she's, she's Barry Croissant. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, so born in London, or you said were, lived in London, born in Turkey. Born in London. Born in London. I actually have three passports: a British because I was born there, Turkish because my parents are Turkish and uh, lived there as a child, and then. Uh, became an American citizen, naturalized when my parents did when I was, uh, I think, six or seven. So, right. and then citizen Bo- of the world. Boston is in there as well, and Chicago. Yeah, so I, my parents moved to Norway when I was uh, at the end of junior high, um, and uh, my dad's there wasn't, you know, good American schools in in Norway. Um, so uh, my dad's company paid for me to go to prep school on the East Coast. Very, you know, amazing experience, changed my life. Yeah. Well, I went to went to Andover outside of Boston. 
So what I think we lost to them in lacrosse down in Florida. They would come down <laughs> to uh, for their spring breaks and beat us. We played football with sticks, but uh, they were playing a different game. But Andover yeah, might have been the one. I picked um, up, yeah, and we've got a great lacrosse program. I played there, actually. Uh, I started late compared to most of those kids, but I actually made the varsity team by my senior year. So it's nice. a lot of fun. It's great sport. Wait, what was the dad's company that they paid for you to go to Northeast Prep School? ConocoPhillips. So my dad okay. was a structural engineer, PhD designs, offshore oil platform. So uh, hence all the move. The connection between London, Turkey, you know, Texas, Oklahoma, and Norway. <laughs> have only, you ever been on one of those platforms? platforms i have i have uh taken a helicopter out with my dad um i mean these are six billion dollar you know plus uh projects that last take four or five years to build don't break even for 50 years right they have like a hundred year life um to them you know a thousand people uh, on a floating uh city in the middle of uh kind of the north sea for example tethered yeah. to the bottom you know miles down to the ocean so pizza and you know, it's like going to space. It's their crazy feats of engineering. So and super technical, right? Don't they? Have, they're like the jets keep them above center and all that stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, each one's different. They have all kinds of different kinds. You know, I'll leave my father to kind of give you the specifics, but right. but, but I grew up around that. It's pretty pretty cool. And so, what was your favorite accent at all those places? It sounds like you haven't really adopted one. Do you flow in and out of them? Well, my daughter and I speak with a British accent quite often, nice. just to play around. But uh, <laughs> no, for the <laughs> but for the most part, no. I mean, I, I grew up speaking Turkish and English. Actually, there's another country in there. I lived in South America, in Chile, for uh, a year in college. Uh, that was supposed to be a one semester thing, and I uh, met a girl and kind of stayed a little longer. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, did live in South America, so speak Spanish as well. Um, but, When's yeah, the book was... coming out? This is all this is all good stuff for a book. <laughs> Yeah, one of these days when I can find time, I'm uh, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of lots to write about. So got it. And so now in Chicago office, and you said live over in Bucktown, which is just a little west of the city. So cool. Um, yeah. So give us a little background on work wise and what you were doing in all those places up until uh, Aegea. Yeah. So uh, believe it or not, I've been here in Chicago now 20 years uh, or more, 22 years, um, but never lived longer than four years anywhere before here. So my whole career um, has been here in Chicago. I uh, came out of here, out here from Rice uh, in Houston. I uh, was hired by a gentleman who uh, had a trading operation uh, out here who was a Rice grad. And uh, there's actually a bunch of us uh, kind of a whole lineage of, of guys that have started their own uh, shops out here. Uh, there's a big prop shop called Belvedere Trading here in Chicago. Yep. The head of that, uh, Tom Hutchinson, is you know hired me in the business basically. Uh, I worked under him uh, early on, um, so we're still very close friends. We knew each other at Rice. He played rugby. I played lacrosse. You know, we were kind of um, friends. So, um, but yeah. Uh, it's, there's a whole bunch of guys, like I said, uh, in the business that have come up that way. It was a bunch of old uh, O'Connor and Associates guys uh, who uh, who started a group for the Royal Bank of Canada. And uh, so we kind of came from that lineage, learned kind of the right way, um, how to do things. Uh, trial by fire, it came in late 98, 99, right before the bubble burst and uh, really kind of learned. Uh, I was on with learned, Sorry, with uh, Jim Kleinhops, who had been O'Connor, somewhere we were talking to O'Connor, and I'm like, there, that would be a great book of just detailing the, right, it's kind of like the Tiger Cubs and just the amount of managers and pros that have I, come out of the O'Connor tree is, is huge. I think it's even more important than the Tiger, you know, Tiger yeah. Cubs on the derivative space. Uh, I mean, they pretty much wrote every single model that's out there. Right. Um, right. Every model pretty much based on it. Every prop sh- you know, firm in Chicago, not every, but I'd say, you know, 85% of them primarily use the same model that comes from, you know, uh, you know, at least the, the original roots well, come they, from there. And, and definitely again, 85% of the ones who've survived. <laughs> so, correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. So no, it's an uh, amazing story kind of, yeah, I agree. It'd be an amazing book. Somebody should write it. All right. We'll do that. That'll be a separate pod and or book at some point down the, uh, down the line. So I cut you out there. So somewhere in there, you were a market maker. Yeah, so I came out here as a market maker um, and uh, trial by fire, you know, moved up the ranks quickly. I mentioned Tom Hutchinson. He and some other guys left to start Belvedere. I moved up very quickly to kind of 
fill the void. That was right as, uh, you know, 2000 came around and, uh, you know, made a lot of money for the firm. In our, uh, you know, in our world, it's a very black and white world. You either make money and you're good at it or you're not. And, uh, you know, I happen to have uh, the capacity to, you know, to excel at it. And, uh, you know, my background was in math, econ. Um, and so it was well suited for the business. And you were making um, a market for the prop firm, like for their own money, not for a bank desk. Correct. Or- yeah. Correct. I mean, it was it was a division of the Royal Bank of Canada, so it was backed by the Royal Bank of Canada, but it was a separate kind of uh, you know deal, basically. That you know the economics were were uh, like 80, 80, 20 to the yeah. They, they the, basically bought it in order to get a profit stream, right? Correct. Correct. So um, anyway, so learned there, moved up quickly uh, as one is prone to do as they gain confidence and you know start seeing how much money they're making for who they work for. They start saying, hey, maybe I can do this, you know, for myself uh, and get my own economics. And that's essentially what I did. I went and started a a group for Bear Wagner Specialists, a specialist firm that was, uh, you know, in New York, uh, in decline, as all specialist firms were in 2003, 2004. Uh, And uh, they were looking to diversify into the market making business. They were talking to CTC, Wolverine, a couple other big firms here in Chicago to potentially acquire them. Uh, A gentleman and I, uh, you know, approached them to, to, create the you know firm from scratch for them and and, and we did that we built that out to uh, you know significant number of traders on and off the trading floor um, and uh, what was the decline the about just from more trading going to the screen yeah exactly the specialist business was basically you know stock specialists at the time were you know up until that point where it was a very lucrative bid ask spread business and everything just went uh, electronic and you know the writing was on the wall like a and, toll collector um, business, right? Like I'm here, if you want access to the stock, you got to pay the toll. Right. And, and if you think about it, market making, you know, on the option side is same idea, but much more quantitative and much harder to kind of uh, completely automate. Um, so just because the number of strikes and the complexity. Yeah. Um, and so it was a natural, you know, he, John Mulhern, he's actually quite famous. He's in Elias Poker, the gentleman who hired me to, um, to, to start the group for them. Um, you know, he had been a options trader early on in the eighties. Um, so he had a good understanding of the space and knew he wanted to get, you know, diversified. It was the right idea. It was just a little too late because by the time, you know, we were two, three years in and building the business, uh, you know, I think their market cap had dropped from over a billion to like $500 million. And, but you were tasked with um, building an option market maker unit. Correct. Correct. And, and we did so successfully. Um, it, the problem was the, you know, the economics we were supposed to scale it to, you know, hundred million dollars in equity um, and leverage that. And, uh, you know, they had capital constraints on their end and then John Mulhern passed away. Um, and, and so it just did end up being quite, uh, you know, as, as big as we hoped, it was a great operation. We learned a lot, built a great business, but uh, you know, I amicably split, took five of the gentlemen with me in 2006 and started my own group uh, back to myself uh, with one outside investor. And, uh, you know, and that's really what I kind of made my name in the business. We grew that to one of the biggest market making groups, you know, in the indexes, uh, we were 13% of SPX volume at our peak during the financial crisis. So 2007, 2008, we were one of the biggest market making groups on the floor and off the floor and, uh, you know, left that, uh, in 2010, after a crazy run, we took, you know, several million dollars and turned it into, you know, 25 times that basically um, over the course of three years. And, uh, you know, I had 95% of my net worth in the business and was just yeah. ready to kind of take a break after a crazy Looking run. So, exit. yeah. So, and we can get into this a little later, but just talk through real quick the, because it's so prevalent in the headlines and the news that market makers are doing this market. I don't think most people really understand what the business model is there. So talk through just quickly what what that what the economics look like, what they're actually trying to do. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, you know, it, market makers, as most people know, are kind of the the uh, the gel that keeps the market together, right? If without uh, without a bid ask spread, there's nobody to sell ninety percent of the time. And there's nobody to buy because you're not going to match exact orders all the time. So somebody's got to provide that infrastructure and, and they're the infrastructure of markets. Um, as, at its base, it's, there's nothing nefarious about it. It's very, 
um, it's a very useful and important part of the business. Yeah. I, feel, um, I feel like most retail traders, especially believe there's another retail trader on the other side of their trade. Yeah, I mean, in equities, a lot of times that's the case, right? There's a, you're yeah. talking about one equity buy and sell orders kind of hitting, but um, you know, in options, you have tens of thousands of strikes for every you know uh, for every series, and you know, you have uh, a million different uh, stocks and products. So it, it's a you know, it's an important thing to have a good market maker on the other side to provide liquidity, especially during times of of stress um, and, you know, when volatility markets are probably at, at their most important. Um, you know, so that having the, been said, uh, sorry, go ahead. I was saying, so at the base level is, hey, I want to buy this option on Krispy Kreme donuts three years out. There's no one else on the other side of that trade. I'm the only one in the world who has this view. The market maker steps in and is like, cool, I'll sell that to you, but I'm going to analyze the risk and add some, add some uh, spread in there basically to cover my, what I believe is the risk. And the successful market maker correctly analyzes that risk and prices it. Correct. And actually, yeah, correct. And in order to be a market maker, you actually commit to the exchange that you are a member at to, to provide a certain width market uh, at a certain time. And, uh, and they can widen that out, tighten it. Um, but uh, for the most part, uh, you know, that's your commitment to, to the business. Now, you know, how much you trade there and how liquid it is will depend on the risk that the market will bear. And, and risk is broadly not measured in kind of just general waving of hands. I mean, the whole, the market makers, you know, market makers see the world in a, in a, you know, multidimensional matrix matrix and every risk is related to everything. And you, you model, um, you know, every risk as it relates to wherever other things are trading in the market. So you're, you're able to, to, perfect market maker world, you've hedged it all out and you're just Correct. making a market with no risk. Um, Correct. Yeah. I mean, a great example is, you know, when you trade an option, particularly a role, you have interest rate risk, right? Um, you know, or something that's in the money. And, and you know, the first thing you do is you go fire out your, your euro dollar, you know, bootleg strip uh, to hedge out that risk, right? And, yeah. and your pricing model is based on where that's trading at any given time. Uh, obviously, your underlying as well is, you know, another component. Um, and, you know, all these things are, you know, are now automated, and automatically hedged uh, into uh, a central book for most market makers. Um, and, you know, the real trade is, is being, um, you know, the edge is being generated off of implied volatilities uh, and directional components if, uh, if you have some directional edge um, based on the flow that you see. And it seems like a winner take all market for a market maker. That's like why Citadel's gotten so big and things like that, right? The more capital you have, the more strikes you can cover. The Increasingly. More yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, it's uh, there's a lot of data involved. There's a lot of execution involved. Uh, there's a lot of volume involved. And uh, at the end of the day, if you can get economies of scale and lower your uh, trading costs and increase your informational flows by getting more flow, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, and you know, improve your techno technology and execution, uh, which itself is an arms race. Um, you know, you're going to come out ahead, and uh, it's a very profitable business. Uh, the information, especially in this day and age, the information that you gain is probably the most valuable thing of all. Uh, that wasn't always the case, but now, you know, just by seeing flows, you have uh, an incredible edge to kind of get ahead of where things are going and and uh, make money on on that side of the trade. Um, and that's a and directional that's a trend? Uh, directional, di directional yeah. for what, right? Yeah, that's directional, always directional, term. right? Yes, yeah. but, uh, directional for vol, directional for, for the underlying stock, just directional for the implied volatility, right? I There's guess, a lot of components. So it's I'll a multidimensional space. <laughs> right, is that, is that flow allowing them to hedge it better or is it allowing them to trade basically opposite it or with it in order to make a profit? Yeah, so if you both. imagine the system, yeah, both. Imagine, uh, imagine a, a system where you have in real time uh, the quickest systems and you're able to make a market um, uh, to knowing that, you're, that somebody's coming in to buy something, they're showing you their hand that they're a buyer, right? Uh, what are you going to do instantaneously? You're going to go sweep any implied volatility you can elsewhere, right? Yeah. Not necessarily in that, that but uh, elsewhere to... Uh, you know, if it has interest rate exposure, hedge your interest rate risk or whatever, right? Um, if it has directional underlying risk to kind of go take that. Um, and 
your offer that you give them to begin with is firm and it's instantaneous and they, they may come and buy it, but if they decide to kind of walk it up and kind of slowly keep upping their bid, right? Uh, then, then the market's going to move against them. And, and that's true for the stock market. You know, it's, it's, true, for, it's true for all products, but it's um, particularly because the uh, options and volatility world is, is so complex and has so many factors, it's, um, there are a lot more opportunities to take advantage of it. And would you, so the broad brush is painted, a lot of that stuff's nefarious and kind of a bad actor. What would you say to that? I, I don't think that's true at all. I mean, the, the reality is it's uh, the most sophisticated players out there are going to win. Uh, and that's true pretty much in every business. Yep. Um, and the most sophisticated players here um, have see more information. They have economy scale, they have better technology. They're faster, they're smarter, they got better models, and, uh, and they, they benefit from it. Um, I don't think, you know, nothing here is uh, illegal or, you know, I think the term front running gets, you know, gets thrown out there a lot. I don't, I yeah. don't, I don't see it as, you know, front running. It's, it's essentially making a market, um, saying I will buy here and I will sell here based on the risk in the market, right? Somebody's gotta provide that service. Um, and, you know, it, as they make that market and, they, and the trade comes in, they hedge it out. And if they have the opportunity to, and they see a big trade is coming to take advantage of the informational flows they have, they do. And that's probably true for any individual out there. See, they see information, you know, correlation information, basis risk, other things, right? They're going to act on it on a more macro scale. Um, and so I don't think it's any different. It's just on a, on a micro level. Got it. And it, in theory, there can be no, but there isn't necessarily a loser on the other side, right? Like some retail guy could buy this option. The market maker makes a market, hedges it off, front runs it, for lack of a better word. They make money. The stock goes up. The option buyer makes money and everybody's happy. Oh, oh correct. And, and to be clear, uh, this is not a riskless trade. I mean, yeah. they've gotten, you know, they've gotten very good at, uh, you know, garnering the information and using, uh, you know, the edge that they have to, to help ensure that they're the casino and make money over the long run. But you know, they lose money on trades all the time. Uh, right. And, right. and the bigger the trades, probably the more they lose, right? They get, because they have to, uh, if there's a block order coming in and they get run over, right? They have to take the first, second, third, fifth, tenth level, right? Um, and, you know, clearly they're, they're trying to, you know, they're getting out of a lot of it along the way. Um, and, and in the long run, they'll make money on it and they'll move the curves aggressively to make sure that they have enough edge to, to, to do well. But, you know, this kind of leads us into what's been happening kind of on the, the retail call buying side. Right. And, and right. Uh, I was going to save yeah. that for later, but sure. Let's, let's hit that now. Cause right. Is that as big of an issue as is being made out in the press that the Robin Hooders are buying all these call options and the dealers, which is the same as market makers, right. Uh, it's kind of used, uh, in the same vein, the dealers or market makers are covering their gamma exposure by buying more stock, which drives it higher, which leads to more call buying. Yeah. What yeah. So I, yeah, I think, I, so first I want to clarify when we say dealers, everybody, you know, that's a broad term. Yeah. Yes. Market makers are a subset of that, but market makers are also laying off their risk to other places that house this risk. Right. And a dealer is essentially somebody who is um, housing, you know, the risk. And a lot of times that's banks, right. Um, you know, it's also prop firms, um, you know, buy side firms that, that, uh, that will take uh, on these positions. But um, you know, the, the important idea here with options is, is broadly, you know, these people are, are hedging the, uh, the trend. So when they, when they warehouse this risk for edge, they're doing it, um, you know, hedged and, and trying not to take the full exposure, right? They're trying to take the, the edge out of it. So um, dealers are... Yeah, dealers are are taking uh, the the trades. They're getting short calls, um, and there's a lot of them. Robinhood is just one of, to be clear, many platforms. Uh, retail options trading has uh, doubled uh, in terms of as as a percent share of volume in the last seven years. So we're not talking decades. We're talking, uh, you know, a doubling very quickly. Yeah, uh, I think I saw one of your tweets. It's up to thirty eight percent. Are single name options now? What was that? 30, 38% of, of, total, uh, of total option volume currently, yes. But in the last year, it's been right around 20, 25%. So it, it's, okay. um, you know, it's not, that's, that's a bit 
that's about over over exaggerated there. But but the reality is, it's a you know we're talking about something that used to be five to ten percent, um, and uh, you know it was always the kind of the dumb money that would get faded, right? Yeah, um, and get uh, over you know overtaken by the more intelligent, sophisticated players out there. I guess I shouldn't say intelligent, but more sophisticated players out there. Um, uh, what's happened is now it's kind of the tail wagging the dog. Um, it's such a big um, set of volume, and it's also, you know, very importantly, single directional, right? The, all of these retail trades tend to be call buying. It's what's kind of more easily understood. Um, it's also kind of betting on these growth names and the convexity to the upside, and kind of buying lottery tickets, right? It's the same idea. So it's important that it's not just a large amount of the volume. It's it's all concentrated in a very specific group. So um, it's having significant effects in that in that group. Um, you know, the, the obvious effects are, as we saw in late August and throughout August, honestly, was, was because of the short, uh, you know, dated call buying, uh, you know, they had the ability to kind of push the market, you know, it, it was already kind of moving momentum wise, uh, up, but they had the ability to kind of push those names specifically because of the pure scale and size higher because of the gamma involved on all these options. I mean, there's so much notional leverage and options, right? I mean, you buy a 10 Delta call. And then it becomes a hundred delta. All of a sudden, you know, you have 10 X the leverage um, on the market than you, than you originally did. And so it's a big, uh, very concentrated buyer with lots of leverage and uh, it has major effects. So the gamma pushed the market up. Now, importantly, dealers are taking this other side of this. Uh, the implied volatility is being forced higher because market makers and dealers are moving you know, they're losing money on these trades, so they're moving the. Right, they're making their <laughs> spread that we talked about earlier. Like this is getting more risky for me. I got to make the spread higher. I'm going to charge you more for that option. Absolutely, not just the spread wider, but they're moving up the level implied volatility aggressively yeah. because they know these guys are buyers, right? So, so um, you know, I might have sold the supply demand. They're buyers. I'm the seller. I'm going to try and sell it higher. Yeah, correct. Especially there's embedded lots yeah. of buyers, right? You're right. going to especially when the price sellers go to right. infinity. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the more buying there is, it doesn't go really linearly. It kind of increases exponentially, right? Because at some point, uh, you know, you just, there's not enough liquidity or capacity to absorb it. And the only way you're going to sell it is if it's, uh, you know, significantly higher or the, the risk return is, is worth your time. So anyway, this is what happened. And, uh, you know, ultimately the street got really, really short uh, implied volatility to the upside and growth names very specifically. Um, it was widespread, and the only way to hedge that uh, is to buy implied volatility elsewhere and to try and spread it off. Um, so there was a, uh, you know, the natural place of, of uh, supply is in the S&P 500 and in value, right? Where there's always uh, call writing, you know, you know, buy rights are a very common thing and they come around very regularly. Um, there's natural call, you know, supply in these names. So, uh, with, you know, ultimately the, the street ended up taking very, very cheap, calls uh, and, and the S&P and, and, and the vol complex, you know, index vol complex in general versus these single name um, uh, calls. And, and how did that end up, right? Eventually all of the deltas that uh, locals or, or, you know, dealers were long um, and, and underlying, they had to sell out um, as, the, as the market declined, right? So they're short gamma, they're short these calls and, and the growth names are long the stock. And They've gone from a 10 delta to a hundred delta. They have all of this long delta. And as it declines, uh, the gamma goes the other way and they have to sell it out. And, and that also importantly didn't just help exacerbate the decline in the market, but it did two other things. And I kind of put this out there before it happened. You, know, you could see this in action uh, about to happen, but because the way you hedge all of this vol is by buying extra vol to help protect yourself against, because yeah. you'll make a lot of money if that vol declines, but you won't in theory lose too much if you have enough vol on the other side. What this ultimately did is there was an oversupply of implied volatility. Once you moved away from the calls and the growth names, and there was all this vol in the S&P complex and other places on that decline, vol implied volatility got crushed. Yeah. And it also led to a rotation. So you had all the selling of stock in the growth sector, right? And all these names that where the, the calls were bought on the decline, whereas that pressure didn't really exist uh, in a major way in, in the broad index. And the index was more broadly pinned because of low implied volatility. So you really got an interesting dynamic there where you got to kind of, you know, we called it in, in real time, you know, look, the market's going to decline. You're going to get ball compression and there's a good chance you're going to get a rotation as well. And, and sure enough, they all happen and, and in a, to a sizable extent. 
which is basically we're seeing market down, vol down, and then some scenarios market up, vol up. And so we're saying this was some of the mechanics going on behind the scenes. So we got way off script there, but it was good. But, uh, but I want to do two things. One, we, we'll get back to Aegea. But one, can you just run through quickly? Because we've already thrown some of these terms out there. Let's just do a little rapid fire definitions of some of these uh, option terms, if you don't mind. So sure. we'll start with the uh, simple ones. Can go super short on these. Delta. Yeah, Delta is the uh, change in price of options relative to the underlying market. And when you say ten delta a 10, ten, so, yeah, a 10 delta would be 0. 0.1 delta. So per one point move in the underlying, that would be a 10 cent move in the option. In the option price, cool. Vega. Vega is the dollar change in options relative to a 1% move in the implied volatility. So if implied volatility goes up by 1% for an option and there's a thousand dollars of Vega, the option goes up in value by a thousand dollars. Theta. Theta is the decay. So the amount of money that comes out of the option value per day of yeah. time. It's They really wanted to make it complex. So we're going to give each Greek a different denominator and different <laughs> unit, right? <laughs> right, right. Like some are percent, some are dollars, some are time. Um, all right, somewhat more involved. You throw this out on your uh, Twitter a lot, the fixed strike vols. Yeah, so a fixed strike vol, a lot of people ask me about this. And it, it's, it's a much more, it sounds much more complicated than it is, but... The reality is when you look at the implied volatility or uh, of, uh, of an at the money option, in the underlying options for let's say the SPX, there is an underlying skew. So if we move down 1% in the market, you're going to actually naturally slide, you know, the, the, the implied volatility of that option that is 1% out of the money is higher than it is here. So that straddle is naturally going to increase um, as you slide down. That doesn't mean that implied volatility has increased. If you see the VIX go up on a down move in the market, that does not mean implied volatility has actually increased. Most people don't understand that. People say, oh, the VIX is going up. The VIX naturally goes higher um, when the market goes down based on the skew in the underlying S&P 500 or, or these products. I'll put my yeah. pencil up there, right? You're just going... <laughs> But tie that back to fixed strike. So, so when you quote so fix, strike. so what's important to look at what market makers do and most sophisticated players do is they look at fixed strike vol. That gives you a real color of how volatility is performing relative to the underlying volatility assumptions that, that the world is pricing on. So if, uh, if the market moves down one percent and we just and, and that that one percent down vol was a fifty vol, the question is not whether it's it's where are we relative to that fifty vol that we've moved to. Uh, not the fact that we were at a 45 vol to begin with, right? Um, so when you look at fixed strike vols, you're looking at the strike by that strike that you're moving to, how much has that volatility changed? Um, and that's why I'm always talking in fixed strike vol. That is actually the correct way to objectively look at what's happening in the implied vol. It's, I'm a sailor. So it's kind of like true wind versus apparent wind. Exactly. Um, it's all relative to the, the embedded assumptions of the market. Exactly. Love it. Uh, skew, which we mentioned already a little bit, but yeah, skew skew uh, is essentially the skewness of the distribution. The downside in equity products is always uh, more highly skewed. Uh, that means there's a higher implied volatility to the downside. Uh, that's Except for August, fault. that we just that, talked about. Even in August. Okay. Even in August. Um, I mean, there's relative steepness of skew, and it changes all the time. Um, you know, that was definitely on the lower end of, of skew, but equity indexes always, I mean, always, I mean, we've never seen, um, I guess there are, when I say always not for a single idiosyncratic, you know, stock necessarily, yeah. but for indices always, um, uh, skew is higher. Why, why is that two reasons? First reason market, the market historically moves much quicker to the downside than it does to the upside. So, uh, there isn't actually a real reason that there should be skew in the market on, on a realized basis. Realized ball is higher than the downside. Right. You've heard the up, market takes up. the elevator. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> elevator down, stairs up. That's exactly right. But we're um, saying the skew is just saying, hey, a 10% away uh, put is more expensive than 10% out of the money call. Correct. Correct. Yeah. It's a, yeah, the same moneyness, or you can look at it in terms of probabilistically delta sticky. Um, people look at it in different ways. Uh, that relationship is always going to be uh, a higher implied volatility per amount of moneyness or uh, probability to the downside versus the upside. 
The second reason, which I want to get to, is not is is a supply and demand issue, and I think that's yeah. the more important issue. Um, the world is long the market. It's long assets. It's long, you know. If you live, you have a job, you're long, right? Like that's just yeah. how it works. I caught the um, financial uh, industrial complex, like the military <laughs> industrial complex, right? Everyone's geared towards making you as long as possible. A hundred percent. And, and you know, that's where the money is made all, in the long run, right? Uh, assets create a yield um, for the most part. So uh, in, these are insurance products at the end of the day. And so if you want insurance, you don't want generally insurance for the upside in the market. You want insurance for to protect your long position. So people buy puts and they sell calls. They write calls against their, their long positions and they buy insurance protection for downside convexity. Um, this supply and demand uh, has always been there. It, uh, it always will be. And, and it creates a overvaluation, right? Relative to outcomes of downside relative to upside. Um, but uh, so that increases the skew. Um, and particularly during times when the market's uh, you know, up on a big run and people are making lots of money, skew tends to be even more exaggerated. Yeah. Um, actually, an interesting point, uh, in the S&P 500, you know, we, we tend to have the highest skew in the world. Um, it, there are lots of other products where the skew is not as steep as here, but this is where broadly the world comes to hedge. Um, and, That's an important uh, point, right? Even if I'm long any country, pick a country, if I'm going to put some hedging program into place, I'm probably using some S&P, if not all S&P. Correct. And that's because, you know, rule of law, this is a safe place to buy insurance. <laughs> if the world's Liquid. Market, you, probably don't, yeah. you probably don't want to have puts in Venezuela, right? Like, yeah. the, uh, you know, that's for one, two, it's very liquid, like you said, and there are dealers and you're able to get some significant size of these things done and get in and out of them. Um, there's several other reasons, but, you know, I think you know, those are the main ones. Uh, all right. Now some next level stuff. Vanna. Yeah. So this is one that is not well known and well used. I want to be clear. Everybody's always asking me on Twitter, like, where can I read more about this? Is this, you know, how the effects of this, uh, you know, there are very few number of people who use, even in the market making space that use Vana regularly. It is a second order derivative. Um, Vana is the change in Delta per change in vol, per change in uh, implied in volatility. So, yeah, so as uh, implied volatility decreases by, or sorry, let's say increases by one. It's, it's the amount of deltas that, that change of your options position. Um, another important one that kind of goes hand in hand with it, which I talk a lot about um, is charm. Charm is a bit more commonly looked at and used, but, but still, you know, second order derivative. Um, that is per, per change in time. Um, so per amount of decay, call it, right? How much your, um, your delta changes as well. Both of these are, you'll notice, are, are, are delta focused um, derivatives, which, right? Right, which ties and, back and, to the market maker's desire to be delta hedge neutral, right? Correct, so that, the reason I use them so much, I look at them so much is, is these really embody a lot of the delta effects of the underlying assets. And the, the, the broad world looks primarily at the underlying assets. And uh, most of the world is not very familiar with how these derivatives can have a substantial effect, especially now that they're, you know, that the leverage in these products has increased so much over the last 20 years. Um, and so understanding these, these delta-based uh, kind of derivatives of the underlying uh, you know, options is, is very important to understanding those flows. Now, why, who, who came up with charm? Where, they lost the Greek alphabet there? What, what was charm? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. I'm actually not, not sure. Like, that doesn't, I think that might be a, still a Greek uh, I don't know. I'm right. asking the wrong guy. I don't really know. We'll look that up separately. <laughs> I'll have to get back to you. Yeah. And then I was actually clerk in the bond pit, staring at the bond options at the board of trade. And right, that was, they all had their sheets, right? And the bond market's moving and they're looking down at their sheets. And I don't think they had Vanna and Charm listed, but they had the calculations of if it moves two points up, I got to hedge with this many futures and they arbit into me in the future space. Right. So that's the whole concept of Delta hedging of, Based on these statistics, based on these Greeks, I know exactly how many futures I need to buy or sell to maintain a zero directional risk. And I'm just then betting on picket volatility or time decay or whatever. Um, Correct. Right? Yeah. And I think, yeah. I think, yeah, going back to my market making days, like we didn't have Vana or Charm on our sheets. We didn't even really look at it uh, very closely, right? We, 
we did look at charm in a sense that we'd move our market, our, our model forward a day or in time. And we'd have a sense of, okay, I'm going to have a bunch of stock to buy back tomorrow or something. Right. Yeah. But it wasn't, uh, it definitely wasn't as discreet and, and uh, definitely not looked at as, you know, as meticulously as I look at it now. Um, uh, again, Delta, Gamma, those things were, were, you know, every second, every minute kind of looking at this and understanding the, the risks associated with that. But uh, yeah, Vaughn and Charm have been, much bigger part of what I look at um, and, and are, are, I think are increasingly important to understand. And Volga, last one. Yeah, so so Volga is is change. It's like the gamma of vol. So per per change in uh, in Vega, it's it's how, per change in vol, how much Vega you add or subtract. So how much uh, vol second, in an increase yeah. in vol? Yeah, correct. So it's essentially the gamma of Vega. Uh, it's kind of like gamma is to delta, Volga is to Vega. Love it. And people right. and people look at Volga a lot more actually on the market making side, uh, you know, than they do some of these other effects. I, I tend to look at it less because it doesn't have as much of an effect on on underlying assets as much as it has an effect on the underlying volatility of of the product. Because for a market maker, that's what could take them out in a body bag, right? If that just explodes, the their focus is their, their focus tends to be on managing implied volatility and the risks associated with implied volatility. Uh, they try and tend to be mark, more market neutral. Um, again, every shop is different. Um, whereas my, my focus and a lot of people's focus is understanding how does this move the underlying product? So with that background, it seems that, and you just mentioned looking at, um, Vanna and Charm. It seems you like to play the players more than the the game. Is that fair to say? And you can get a little. <laughs> I think there's a song like that. But, um, <laughs> there is. I'm not going to go down, go there. But yeah, <laughs> don't, don't, but, don't don't hate the player, hate the game. I think that's what it is. Yeah, don't hate that. the player, hate the game. But uh, but you're kind of looking at how the vol service reacts to um, all these different players and what they're showing in the market with these different readings, and then kind of the feedback loop that that generates. So yeah. So what I've discovered in the last, yeah, what I've discovered really in the last five to 10 years is um, there's a ton of sophisticated players and some of the most sophisticated players out there looking at what's high, what's low, trying to put on relative value positions and implied volatility on a dispersion basis, on an underlying basis within each product, uh, on a correlation basis. You know, that, that is so picked over, right? And the reality is what ends up happening is the edge in those types of positions are, are very transient. They don't, they don't really kind of stick. At the end of the day, uh, the way you end up capturing those, that, that edge that's there is essentially getting out ahead of, of how the underlying movements are going to affect the balls and um, skews themselves. Right, based on that position, as well as the underlying uh, movement of, uh, of you know, the moving of the underlying asset as well. Um, and I'll give you a good example again, that, that may be a little bit confusing, but um, imagine, and this is kind of a common, uh, this is a kind of a common one is, you know, uh, at monthly ex or quarterly expirations, um, vol and skew tend to be elevated relative to the week or two weeks following it. Why is that? Because supply and demand, those are the most traded assets. There's a lot of structured product tied to these monthly and quarterly contracts. Um, it, it's, it, you know, if that's where all the volume in is and that's where all the buyers are, you're going to get a lot of buyers of puts, uh, you know, in those, those products, sellers of calls, and you're gonna get higher skew and probably higher implied volatility. So if this is a regular occurrence, you know, you think, well, I'll, I'll just go sell those monthly and quarterly and I'll go buy the puts or ball behind yeah. it, right? Great spread. Yeah, that is a good spread, but, not surprisingly, it doesn't tend to realize into you know any meaningful profits. Why? Because the whole street has that position on. Yeah. Right? If the whole street has that position on, it's a valuable, good relative value trade. But what ends up happening is it has effects on how the market moves, both in terms of the underlying and volatility and skew as the market moves. So given that same position, let's imagine a downside put spread, the market goes down, you're, you uh, right going into expiration, let's say a week before that, you know, let's talk about now, uh, what happened on Monday, the October, uh, you're short, you're long the October uh, 30th puts behind it, market goes down into your shorts and they're high, 
Um, what happens to the October 30th? The October 30th skew and vol gets compressed. And Vega broadly gets compressed because you own really cheap skew and really cheap Vega because of this relationship that exists. Yeah. So the reality is you can't just put that spread on and say, I'm going to make money because everybody has it on. So the second that the October declines, the October 30th is going to decline and SKU is going to have to decline and implied volatility behind it's going to have to decline, right? And so understanding that, that's those are the effects that are internal to SKU and vol and the effects that these positions will have on, 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 the, on the SKU and vol. But also what you'll realize is as that October decays away and you're just left with the October 30th, which was really cheap, you have to, there's charm and there's, um, and there's mana to these products. So the October is disappearing. That was your long Delta versus your short Delta behind it. Um, what happens as that disappears? You have to be, you have to be buying the underlying, right? Or selling some other ball somewhere in the put, in the put wing. At an help. increasing rate. At increasing rate, exactly. Yeah. And so what does that do? That affects, you know, as the days pass and as the implied volatility drops into these down moves, it forces buying versus buying of that underlying asset and it supports the market. And these flows are big. These are big. I mean, the world has a skewed trade on. Everybody buys puts, sells calls. Dealers are short put, long call in the indexes. And it's a very profitable trade because you're selling a high vol, you're buying a lower vol and you're short stock. And there's some short convexity to it. There's some risk to it, right? But on in total, this is a, a, a carry trade that's very profitable. But every day that goes by, right, you have to go buy that, Delta back, that's charm. And as that volatility gets, volatility gets compressed, you have to also buy that Delta back. Which, and so during periods of the calendar, it's very important. It happens every month, every quarter, to the extent there's open interest that's sizable um, and that there, there's more, you know, you've moved into uh, you know, more, you know, long ball uh, or, or short, sorry, short put in the front, long ball in the back, it's even more, um, it's even greater. So. Um, by using this framework and understanding the positioning that's actually out there, you can really get ahead of what's about to happen. You can see the supply and demand flows coming. Now, but is, you... that the only, is that the only factor out there? Is that driving everything? Like, no. And, and yeah. I think, you know, I think some people interpret like, that's all I look at. And that's the only, absolutely not. But if, you, if you're looking at a world that doesn't include that information, you are flying blind. It is yeah, becoming such lost. an important factor. You're lost. And people don't understand why these things are happening. And you know, people's eyes are coming out of their head when they see kind of the predictive power of these things. It's incredibly important. Um, you know, these flows are increasingly, um, you know, driving markets in these, in these windows, in these important periods where Vana has increased, right, towards expiration cycles. So understanding this is very important to uh, to getting out ahead of, of, of the Delta and the uh, and so let, market. Let me ask. So that was... I've, that was present in February of this year, right? So it's like there's a feedback loop, feedback loop until there's not, right? Yeah. So, so it's, how it's, does it that's exactly right. from everything you just said to when there's a crash? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's basically two counteracting factors, right? There's there's gamma, right? And then there's Vana and Charm. I kind of put Vana and Charm together. They're two kind of sides of the same coin. Yeah. One's a function of time, one's a function of, of, of vol. But, you know, if I'm short of out of the money put, and I'm uh, long and out of the money call, right? And I go to strike or towards strike and time passes and that put expires, right? I have a lot of deltas to buy back, right? Yeah. But if you go through it and the speed of the, the move is big enough, right? Right? Then you don't have stock to buy back. <laughs> then, you, then you've actually, that's gamma, right? Then you've accelerated and that's, that's convex, right? You can really lose a lot of money on that. And that effect itself is very important as well. I mean, so you can't just look at bond and charm and say, hey, I'm going to go buy stock. And that's why people don't just go, go preemptively, just go buy a bunch of stock going into this period. It's like, and that's why they do it over time. Time passes, they'll buy stock. End of the day, every day, buy stock. Morning, decay comes in, buy stock. Yeah. That's why it comes at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, right? People are moving their curves, resetting their curves, saying, okay, I have Delta to buy. And, and, and there are people out there with algos front running these as well. So it kind of get, comes even a little earlier. But the reality is it's, you know, there's embedded risk because, you know, that speed, all of a sudden you buy back all the stock and let's say the last day or two days before expiration work, all of a sudden you bought back all the stock and then it declines dramatically through your short, right? Lose yeah. your shirt. Nice. And so what happened, in, so what happened in- And in, then they're uh, puking in, out. Yeah. Exactly. And so what happened in March is not a coincidence. I think that not enough ink has been spilled on this, but I think the, you know, in March when we declined, the bottom in the market happened right at March expiration. 
literally the, the bottom, the peak and ball, the bottom of the market happened the day of yeah. March expiration. March 23rd or something. Yeah. yeah, not a coincidence. Why did that happen? Because everybody was short gamma. They were getting margin calls. Everybody was short March. They were long behind it, right? Because March is where all the demand is and people were short. And the second March rolled off and expired, everybody was left long ball, long protection, no longer had margin calls, market stabilized, took off. Um, and so, you know, these, these factors are, and again- Then they could go back just to a, just their normal buying buying pattern. Every yeah, day. not just buying pattern, like then you're less long, this vol at a really high vol. Everybody is all of a sudden went from, I gotta buy this back to, oh my God, I better get rid of this and sell this. Otherwise, right, this is on an 80 vol. Right, like, um, but it still stayed risky. elevated for quite a bit. But yeah, I mean, eighty down to thirty. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. No, hundred percent. But there's, but that's also and we can get it, go down a rabbit hole here. But that's also why after big events, tornado comes through town. Insurance is always the best sale at that moment, right? You're less likely, and it's actually there's a reflexivity to it. I mean, you're less likely to get these declines in the market when everybody's prepared for them. Implied volatility is higher right now. You know, people are, are less willing to sell things because they're they've been the sellers have been pushed out of the market. A people have a recent memory of, of but isn't, uh, isn't the that, risk involved. That seems like it's true only until it isn't true, right? So you can be like, oh, we just went down thirty percent. Now's the time to sell vol until the day when we go down sixty percent. Then you're right. Oh, I'm not. I'm not talking in absolute terms. These yeah, are yeah, yeah. Prob probabilities, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, you have. You have, uh, I mean, I think a great example of that is 2017. The amount of risk at those low implied volatilities, right? In yeah, 2017. Like well, no, I, I beg to differ, and that's the thing. Nobody, okay. yeah. nobody would uh, want to sell because the risk on their sheets looks awful. It was actually the most profitable year in history to sell implied volatility. Um, it was the lowest realized volatility and, and risk adjusted as well. When I say risk adjusted is relative to the amount of money that was lost at any point, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was the but most that's profitable. in hindsight. In the moment, it was scary trade, though, right? Because you're so low. Well, for some, but the reality, the reality is, there's a reflexivity, and I think that's important that a lot of people miss here. And I'm kind of going off track, but but when implied volatility is compressed, the market, everybody is long it again. Supply and demand. If the world is stuck long ball, market's not going anywhere. Yeah. It can it, it, it actually like it's not just because oh people are long vol and they'll make a lot of money. They're structural. Like people have to, will hedge that profit as the market moves. The market moves half a percent, and you, you're long very cheap ball. You're gonna, you're gonna buy some stock. The market goes up half a percent. You're gonna sell some stock, and that's that's the power of gamma and vol. And everybody was long vol in 2017, and it reflexively pinned the market, created you know the lowest implied vol in history by 30 percent. Yeah, the most greater than a three percent. Yeah, greater one. than a three percent. Yeah. Right. I can't remember what a yeah. 61 days or something without a one percent move. Yeah, the, it was uh, the biggest move was less than three yeah. percent, and you know, from peak to trough. So I want to talk for a second about. So you're using also some of this flow information and Vanna and Trump to inform trend following, right? Correct. Which so we, we should take a, a stop and go into what Agia does, so we can come back to that. Yeah, so AG has been around uh, since uh, late 2011. Uh, our primary focus was originally, and still, you know, a big part of it is is relative value long vol. Um, our flagship products uh, are still long vol uh, products. Um, we uh, obviously started that in 2011, and riding it through uh, 2017 was, uh, you know, we yeah. created a ton of created a ton of that alpha. Uh, but the market went straight up and, uh, you know, I think our average alpha for including uh, these recent years is, is just over 11%. Um, what do you so base? A good chunk of alpha, but, but, but a negative beta, beta you're, you're basing? Just basing on underlying, right? I know that's not a perfect metric, but, uh, yeah. you know, I'd actually say we have a lot more alpha than that because we're long vol and long vol itself intrinsically has negative alpha. So we've kicked off a negative, a positive, sorry, 11% um, uh, to the market um, with a negative one beta, you know, this is a, a product that you know has, has been has had a lot of edge in it, and we've we've done a lot of great things with. But the tough the tough business side of being, being a long vol product uh, is the markets tend to go up, uh, and implied volatility tends to be uh, overvalued, you know, relative to realized. And so uh, you know it, it's not a, a very profitable business in the long run unless unless you're just collecting a man a really chunky management fee. 
Um, so we have a decent chunk of assets. You know, we've been doing it for a while. We have a couple of institutional clients, but um, you know, we decided as a business to really uh, shift towards where we think there's more edge, uh, a much more scalable product. Uh, you know, understanding we have this deep expertise in, in understanding how the markets move. Um, and uh, how these uh, these products affect those moves, and uh, you know, part of me going out on Twitter, you know, yes, I, I like to 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 educate and to do other stuff, but it's really to get the word out about how this is an important product and and how um, you know people should be um, understanding uh, how this can add value to uh, their investments. Um, and so I always we're, wonder, we're looking, like, you know, sometimes you're like, this, I'm getting out of my lungs here at 30. Like, it seems like you've given away a lot of info there. Yeah, no, hundred uh, percent. Sometimes I, you know, wonder how much I, of this I should be, you know, communicating. Right. Uh, but, but yeah, no, this is very inside baseball stuff. This is, you know, forged by fire. I, nobody taught me this. I taught, you know, this has been complete self-education on, on how markets move. You do this for 22 years and the, the think of these markets, you learn a lot. So I think this is valuable, important stuff to people. Um, but I also think without being on the inside and really understanding these flows and having the the approach and expertise that we have, I think it's very hard to replicate. So um, I think I like, did it know. used to be easier. It seems so hard now, right? Like you got to know all this stuff. It used to be like, okay, I got to have a view on where the market's going and I'm going to trade that. And Making I, money on the implied volatility relative value stuff used to be easier. Uh, yeah. And that's part of why I think we're moving away from that as well. I think there's just much more edge. Um, you know, I think the edge from these relative value trades in the ball market really get, like I said, stripped out by, the actual underlying move. And if you can get out in front of the underlying move in a, you know, in a, in a very kind of risk adjusted positive way, you can make a lot more money with a much more simplified position um, and do it in a much more scalable way. These vol trades are not that scalable um, and they're also not as liquid. And so just, uh, I think it's, it's a, it's a great business model. I'm excited uh, that we, you know, we've, we've started kind of uh, running this on the prop side and we're going to have you know, they have an amazing track record going on it already. And then they're excited to launch that probably in the next six months. Wait, so dive more into that. You, I lost myself there for a second. So, cause no I problem. asked about trend fund, but we didn't talk about trend fund. Yeah. Yeah. So let me go, let me go into the underlying. So obviously there's a lot of trend following means a lot to a lot of different people. And, you know, again, I'm, I don't come from the trend following, you know, uh, world. So some people I might uh, kind of, I'll, I'll yeah, so, so get off course. Some some people might uh, you know beat me up for for the the terms the semantics I use. But but uh, yeah, I mean I, I consider it trend following in the sense that we are you know we're using big data sets uh, and, and we're looking at technical indicators as well as um, you know volume and flow indicators um, in the broad market and pairing that with the flow and uh, you know uh, indicators that we have on the vol side to. To, to come up with, uh, you know, predictive analytics to help us, you know, get an edge. And I, I think everybody's kind of seen how, how good some of these things are. But I mean, to be clear, I, I'm not just looking at these uh, Vana and Charm flows on their own, you know, looking at it, uh, you know, looking at basic mean reversion, looking at momentum, looking at, uh, you know, sentiment and, uh, you know, put call ratios, uh, you know, uh, I could go on and on, but there, you know, we have a 24 factor model and, and we're really kind of uh, you know, first starting with qualitative measures of understanding uh, our framework and how we believe this world works and who the different participants are, not just in the ball space, but, you know, risk parity, um, you know, uh, ball, ball control, all kinds of other products that are out there, uh, the trend following space and, and trying to get out in front of when those flows kind of tend to tend to come into the market at what spots and, and get ahead of them. And, but it's all still reflected in options. So it's all option trading or you'll do fixed no, no. futures. You do outright no, we're, silver we're or both. something. Or no, no, the, the CTM is very much uh, trend following underlying. Um, we are looking at where the underlying in the uh, S and P and the NASDAQ, as well as uh, we're primarily focused on equities. Now that's just where our expertise lives, but yeah. really trying to understand, um, you know, and get out in front of how these things are going to move relative to one another and, and, and independently on their own. And then taking delta directions uh, as well as uh, implied volatility directions um, based on that. So uh, maybe yeah, I'll write so, short vol at times. Yeah, a great, absolutely, a great example. I did that the other, I think, last week. Uh, I was like, look, implied volatility is oversupplied. We're up against. Uh, we're very overextended. We're at like the two standard deviation up, right? There's uh, underlying vana flows that are supporting this market, right? You have all these different flows and factors. So this market's going to be pinned for a week. Go yeah. sell vol. Don't, don't try and take a direction one way or the other. There's not much to do there, but you should do so it so well. And so, and so, so that's what we did. Hybrid between the, the model and the factors and discretionary? 
The discretionary is more um, is more leverage based. So we will leverage on, leverage off, risk on, risk off. Uh, you know, even that is is fairly quantitative. But uh, you know, we do have the discretion there. The model itself is very kind of um, algorithmic, quantitative. Uh, it's not auto execute. You know, we are we are deciding exact moments, and uh, you know, we're trying to you know, a, a, when you have a lot of experience, you want to use as much of that as possible without yeah. without uh, you know being you know, messing with your kind of system too much. Right. And without um, but, spending $12 million to code your brain, right? Of like, correct. Correct. And there's just some things that, you know, almost impossible to code. There's just, yeah. uh, you know. So next we got some Twitter people wanted some more color on this of you and uh, Mike Green on Twitter got into a little, uh, <laughs> friendly debate. I wouldn't call it a debate, but a friendly yeah, so, sharing of info on yeah, so, uh, momentum versus <laughs> value. So give me your side of the equation. Yeah, I want to like be clear about this before I get started. I don't want to speak for for Mike. Uh, he's not here to defend himself. Yeah. Not that he needs to. I have the utmost respect for him. He's been on the right side of most trades for many decades. So I'm not, you know, I, I tread very lightly when I'm debating with that man. Um, <laughs> Why? Yeah, to be, yeah. To be clear though, you know, my expertise is I'm a practitioner in the vol space. I have a very kind of unique perspective on, on how these things work. This, this debate is not uh, central to my, my background in, in the vol space. It's really, uh, you know, I'm also the kind of sort of the, out the front of this, uh, you know, I studied uh, public policy in college as well as uh, math econ. So I have this great interest in, uh, you know, economics policy. And, you know, it's, it's something that I do on the back end that informs some of my kind of broader kind of trend ideas. Um, but, um, but for the most part, I just want to say like, you know, this is really kind of healthy debate on something that I'm interested in um, and not really yeah, no, central which, to is, which is what um, I'm interested in too. So, yeah. yeah so, um, but, but Mike's, you know, obviously as everybody knows, or most people know, he is, he is uh, for the last, you know, decade been right on about the move from active to passive and the effects that that has on, on, on the momentum um, factor and, and particularly uh, growth, uh, large cap growth, which is tied to that momentum factor and has been uh, in recent history. Um, he's been spot on and uh, he continues to pound the table on this is just the beginning uh, and that this will continue for, um, you know, for an extended period of time. And, and my Again, it hasn't even been pushed back, but my, you know, the reason we kind of got connected is, you know, I was really arguing at the top there in August that we're going to start to get a, a value to growth rotation. And my argument was originally based on the vol arguments I made earlier, but I also said, I think this can continue for, you know, an extended period of time. And meaning uh, this is a, a, a beginning of, you know, in fits and spurts, a, a decade long, um, you know, this trend could really be a broader, broader trend. And my point uh, to that was, I, you know, with the upcoming election, um, you know, I had this mental model that that monetary policy uh, has been a major, um, you know, the influence in, in, in terms of creating uh, this growth momentum factor. I think it's as important um, as probably more important than um, than just the active to passive move. I think the active to passive move is important. It's critical. Um, it, it is a driving force, but I do not think it, it, it's the Force. I don't think it's the only force. And I think, you know, essentially we're giving- talk, And we're basically yeah. talking about FANG outperforming everything else and Apple being Co the size of the whole Russell 2000 and all those Correct. sorts of stats of why is that Co happening? Besides those Correct. being great companies, is there yeah, some my, deeper thing? And Mike would say, well, part of it is because everyone's moving to passive. You're saying, yeah. well, part of it is because there's huge fiscal policy stimulus. I, I'm saying actually that the, up until monetary. now, there's been a huge monetary policy right, stimulus. Yeah. And monetary policy at its core is lowering interest rates and providing money to companies. If, uh, if you're a company like Amazon or uh, like Amazon was, not now, but Amazon was yeah. when they were starting I actually out. I stuck up for you on Twitter there and through that uh, Amazon I, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, the, <laughs> that's right. Uh, <laughs> I need all the help I can get against them. So keep yeah. it coming. Uber is another great example. Um, you know, these are companies that would not have survived in any other market time. Uh, they're companies that have survived because they've been given um, basically limited uh, liquidity um, and ability to invest and, be, and, and drive loss leaders, right, uh, for, for decades plus and to, to, to focus on a 20-year goal uh, without profits. And if you do that, if you create a, a, a 
a structure that allows companies to dream up uh, mining meteors on asteroids or right. creating, you know, you know, spaceships and going to Mars um, without a profit. Um, eventually, these things will win. It may be 40 years, but they will win uh, if you allow them to do it without a profit. You provide them unlimited liquidity. Right, especially if they're the first mover in that space. But who's and, and allowing so, them to do it without a profit? The, the monetary, the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve is creating. But they're not directly really funding interest. it. But you're saying because investors can access that cheap Federal Reserve money for basically nothing, or at the banks, and the banks can in turn give it to investors for cheap. That it's flowing down into the system and creating this. There, there's no real risk if you can get 30-year money at three, four percent, right? There, there's no there's no real risk to a liquidity event for these names, right? Tesla could have easily have gone out of business, right? Yeah. Uh, four, three, four years ago or two years ago, right? They, they, they don't have cash flows. The argument was solid that, you know, they don't have the lifeline. If, if there's a liquidity event during that time, they'd be out of business. But the market and broadly, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve has allowed, um, you know, infinite liquidity and protected the downside uh, and this is communicated through two main factors. You have scarcity or the Tina effect, right? People have to put their money somewhere because there's no other place to put their money. Tina um, equals there is no alternative. There is no alternative, exactly. And and secondarily, because uh, you have a, uh, a moral hazard, for lack of a better term, where the Federal Reserve will come in and support markets and provide even increasing liquidity at any with any risk of a liquidity crisis. So if you have this situation, you, uh, you're naturally favoring these names and eventually they're going to win. You know, a, a Amazon is going to beat a Walmart because Walmart, unless Walmart is willing to do the same thing and compete on the same terms. And, and so growth names or, or, you know, that are willing to not spend uh, attention to cash flows and pay attention to future growth will ultimately uh, see the benefits in the market. So that, that's, a broad, that's a broad concept. And the passive active is a critical part of, of the communication mechanism of how that works. But my point to him was because this is the case, as we move away from monetary to fiscal, we haven't done that for 40 years. And right? define that real quick. Monetary is Fed policy. Fiscal is sending people checks. Correct. It's sending essentially lending money to companies. And uh, you know, when you lend money, individuals, for the most part, don't borrow money. Wealthy individuals and companies borrow money for the most part. And uh, so, so monetary policy is lending money. Fiscal policy is actually getting dollars do, uh, into people's hands, whether it's by, uh, you know, uh, healthcare, like, uh, yeah. you know, uh, whether it's through infrastructure spending uh, or just dropping money out of a helicopter. I mean, I think that's the right. kind of Bernanke example, right? Fiscal and we're basically policy, saying we've, we've exhausted the monetary side. Yeah, mon- I mean, we're, at zero, we're at zero percent interest rates. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, you can go negative. Yeah, you can do more QE. But the, the you're all, you know everybody's heard the term pushing on a string like the Feds the more the you know they're at a, the lower bound the more they do they get very little effect at this point and they've yeah. been very vocal how they, about how they want fiscal policy to take the handoff they want fiscal right. policy hey, and, we're, and, we're out of arrows over here can you guys <laughs> correct and and because of the political environment here uh, we haven't been able to for many many years we haven't had to until really about four to eight years ago it's been you know more pressing. But we're at a point now where it's necessary. The Fed is very uh, aware of it. And importantly, I think this is the part that people are missing. The, the zeitgeist has changed. The way people realize the inequality that has been driven by monetary policy is unsustainable as well. And the masses for once are actually broadly clamoring for more fiscal policy, more infrastructure spending, more direct spending and money to people as opposed to corporations. And I think that has become politically untenable you know, for for people who are not arguing for that. So I think that political push, it's in my opinion, it's, it's essentially an inevitability. Obviously, you'll have corporations and lobbying that will will try and fight some of these trends. But I think the political movement is such uh, in such a place where, regardless of what party you're in, you're going to get some amount of increased fiscal spending. You think we'll get, get Fed co- basic income? I, I think eventually you will, yes. I don't think that's going to happen right away. That's going to be a stair step, uh, but I think that's the natural kind of ending well, place of where like we're going. Right now. Like, hey, the country can't keep going unless you pay these people another check. Give them another Correct. I, I think the first, you know, like we'll see who gets elected, right? The election, I mean, this is why this has also come up. I think I come up. the election here is is not just important, you know, for other reasons, but it, I think the most important structural reason for, for, you know, thing for markets is, 
under a Democratic or Biden administration, I think you'll get a very, very quick move to aggressive fiscal policy. And I think their first, they've been very vocal. Their first move is uh, massive infrastructure spending bill. Um, I, I think infrastructure spending has a, has a, a massive multiplier on it. You're not, when I say that, you know, per dollar you put in, you get $3 out. Why? Because you create a job and you pay those people money, but then you create something that then also generates more profits for companies, for individuals, Especially um, and it's well, system. construction here in Chicago, right? That's for example, and it depends what kind of infrastructure you're talking about, right? But yes, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, infrastructure is 5G networks. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, uh, electric, uh, you know, electric gas stations, whatever, you know, you can do a million things to help, uh, you know, a green new deal, right? Whatever you want to call it. Um, all of these things are infrastructure spending and, and uh, you know, that money flows directly to individuals and that creates price inflation. That when people have money, for the most part, lower middle-class people spend money. They don't go buy investments. They do to some extent. But yeah. lower to middle class don't have enough money to save. They're they're trying to get by. They're trying to pay their rents. But and doesn't so Amazon pay. wins either way, right? Yeah, sure. But the, you have to realize it's all relative to valuation, right? Yeah. So so yes, uh, this should be brought. This is what the economy needs. The Fed says it as well. This is not my opinion. This is you know textbook. Like this is what yeah. the economy needs. The economy will do better under this environment, especially because we're the reserve currency and we can afford to do this without a major you know, problem on that end, the, the right, problem- Right, let's borrow is, at 0.1% for 100 years. Right, the problem, the problem with this for the markets is the economy could do very well. And ironically, that's not good for the market. Yeah. That's not good for the market because if interest rates go higher, if inflation goes higher, which is a natural result of fiscal policy, long-term rates unwind this whole mechanism we've been talking about how the growth- multiple game, right? You know, the price you buy these things on almost doesn't matter, right? Uh, but if interest rates go higher, there's an alternative. There, there's no longer, it's, the Tina effect disappears, right? You have yeah. higher, you have three, four, five percent bonds. You have I've always, to this. I've always contended like there's no way interest rates can ever go higher. Like everything is based so entrenched that's what right on lower, that's except if you give the people money directly. That's because we haven't done this policy we've done supply right. side trickle it's not just monetary policy we've been doing supply side economics since reagan we've been giving companies money and expecting it to trickle down and guess what it hasn't trickled down yeah right the but economy is good even the mom yeah. and pops like need cheap mortgages and like car loans like everything's based on low credit right on low correct. rates correct so at the end of the day look the, the my, my theory here is like it's not going to happen overnight i'm not calling for you know you know, fiscal policy will take a while to work through the system. Initially, it'll be very positive for the economy, and the market will probably see that as a, a broad positive, right? And you're saying but value will outperform growth when and if that and, happens. Right, because cash flows will, to value will, Are will go through the roof. Are you being paid off by Cliff Asnes? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely not. So, but, but this is bad for multiples. Yeah. Higher interest rates is bad for multiples eventually, and, and, and things that are trading on ridiculous multiples will will be affected. And so this is There's my none of those argument around right now. Are they? <laughs> I mean, look, when things get too extreme, people are always like, but what is the mechanism with, which is make it, which is going to make this come back into life? I'm trying to give you a broad framework that, that will, will create this at some point. This is how it will play out. Yeah. Mike Green's argument is you still have a secular active to passive trade and that's not going away. And yeah. my argument is, it but he also feels away. that makes the system more fragile and it would be more apt to break with a little trigger. So you could both True. be right. True. And that's, right. and that's exactly right. We're talking about orthogonal kind of arguments. They're not right. contrary. Uh, and I agree with his argument. Um, my, my point is, I think this move from monetary to fiscal is how money flows through the entire system and is much bigger than yeah, the yeah. active to passive flow. And ultimately, if you get a, a, a revaluation of multiples and growth relative to value, I think this cycle could eventually untether uh, growth, right, from momentum. Value could become the new momentum name. Yeah. And, and then, you could eventually get an active to passive move that is a tailwind to value, not growth. Now, right, you can get a passive that, move in value. Yeah. Yes. And that's, just, but again, that would take a big kind of massive multi-year move, right? Yeah. 
you'd have to have massive momentum move. And, and, you know, there's a lot of mechanics where he still is kind of, uh, you know, he, he basically doesn't agree with certain of the, the mechanisms that I talk about, but that's the broad argument. We could go d- deeper, but you know, and yeah, uh, I, love it. I think he, I think he agreed on, on, on some major parts of what I'm saying. And I think, you know, I definitely agree with, with his theories. Yeah. Uh, I think we've, we've agreed that the only way this is really going to happen is a broad re- revaluation of the market where growth massively underperforms value on the downside. And then, uh, and, and he said, basically, how, well, how are you going to get people buying value to begin with before? How's it going to create that momentum on a, on a flow level? And my argument is it'll come from corporations, you know, uh, whether they increase dividends or whether, by, if you can no longer borrow money, you're dependent on your own cash flows. And if your cash flows are increasing and you're getting more earnings, you're going to increase your dividends, you're going to increase your buybacks, and that will ultimately provide uh, support for these names and create, uh, you know, relative momentum relative to, to growth and uh, underpin those names. And that's kind of where I think the ultimate, you know, whether it's through, uh, you know, M&A, dividends, buybacks, LBOs, you'll have, uh, you'll have the ability to uh, kind of support names with real earnings and cash flows. We'll go back to a DCF kind of right. model. I know it's like, dust off those old text. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But, uh, yeah. It hasn't happened in 40 years. So that's the thing. Whenever you're arguing for something that hasn't been in 40 years, you automatically get people looking at you like you're crazy. Right. But, um, but, but cycles happen and, uh, you know, they happen fairly reliably on a lot larger scale. And it's, sometimes it's, it's easy to confuse macro cyclical for secular. And I think this is we're getting to the end of a macro cycle, major macro cycle uh, of capital versus labor. And people are lost thinking that there's a secular, you know, 200 year, uh, you know, movie yeah. here. And so. There you go. I love it. Last bit, you mentioned the election and you've been uh, talking a lot about the different, right? At first it was just like, oh, October VIX futures are high because of the election and they look 30 days out. And then it was like, oh, well, November futures are now high and now December is elevated. So go through a little bit of those. It's fascinating, right? If I feel we're kind of like, how vol works, it looks out through these. And we've also introduced this new thing of like how the election actually works, right? That there's a vote, but then they get tallied and then there's the electoral college vote. So it's like vol surface on top of how our elections work, which is absolutely fascinating. So until, I'll be candid, like until eight to 10 years ago, you know, when I first started the business, event vol wasn't even a thing. There wasn't even like a discrete event vol People didn't even look at this. They should have, right? And obviously, they did it. As, you know, they did it in. I want to be clear in the indexes on a macro level. Yeah. This was done for earnings, right? This was done for for yeah, you know, right. merger, events. arbitrage, or something. Yeah, Co- correct. But um, you know, people broadly kind of faded these events, and you know, a lot of sophisticated, you know, just like any other thing, people started pricing in discrete event balls and 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 doing it, uh, you know, successfully for a profit. And, uh, you know, then you started seeing a real move in the surface of, of equity indexes and other products based on these events. Um, and, you know, if you know how to do it, and I'm not going to walk through the math, but a lot of guys on here, I'm sure, will, will figure it out. You know, you can, you can price the relative to the curve, right? The event, um, you know, move that's being priced in, uh, that's extra. And you can do that with multiple events, um, dep- depending on how you define a discrete event. That's very important, right? You know, yeah. what's an event, what's not is, is you know, always a challenge. Um, and so by doing this, you know, we're able to look and see uh, uh, in real time what the November you know, 4th election is relative to the things around it. Um, and it's been very cheap, uh, like relative to, in my opinion, right? We're running about $73, $74 in the S&P 500. You know, you're talking about essentially a 2% move, um, you know, in, in, the, in the underlying, I think for something that's as big as it is, uh, that seems incredibly inexpensive. Um, and it's particularly cheap, and I think this is important, um, all the way up to November, November 27th, it's still very cheap relative to December and January, implied ball. And actually it's come in quite a bit and it's normalized, but for an extended period there, I was, uh, it's still high, but it, you know, relative to where it was, it's normalized a bit. Um, it's been a very profitable trade for us, but, but, you know, for the longest time, people were not, were pricing in a massive secondary event, which was uh, this, uh, you know, contested election world falls apart post-election. 
like the election passes, we don't have any new information really. And then there's a contested election and people right, are being like, you know, we don't buy it in the streets. Who wins? We just care that somebody wins. Then it's safe, right? That the world doesn't fall apart or that there's not, you know, um, you know, and I think that got overblown. Uh, actually, I feel confident and obviously the, the, the price movement has borne that out. But essentially the problem with that, you know, in terms of a mental model is, you know, you know, an election is going to happen. You know, there is a hundred percent probability that there's going to be an event uh, election and, you know, put a number on it, but, you know, 75 to 95, depending on how you look at it, uh, percent of you know, the time you're going to get the majority of the information of who the winner was, right? Even if it's on, contested for, you know, on that election day yeah, or, yeah. Within, or the days following, right? Within, you know, by the time the votes are counted. Now, granted, there's there's always risk, right? There's a five, there's a five, point of 538.com, 5%. I think they're underestimating 20% chance that it's contested. In a, in a, and when I say contested, not just that Trump or Biden contested, but that there is a realistic kind of argument that a Supreme Court or whatever would would hear out to, um, you know, to change the results, right? Um, and so if, if that, that's a conditional probability. You have to get past that first election, right? And then let's say there's a 20% chance of then there being a contested election, you know, then based on 20%, what, you know, what are the moves that are going to happen? You have to kind of right. dig through those probabilities. We and should... once you're down to a 20% probability from a 100% probability, regardless of how big that's, I mean, not regardless, at some point it'll be worth it, but, but if you're talking about, you know, 5% move, under 20% likelihood, right? Uh, yeah. That, that's, yeah, it's a big move and it's scary, but the odds of it happening are still one in five. Yeah. And so, so I think, I think the, the uh, yeah. And so the pricing just got, like people were, it was, it was based on fear. People were pricing like, oh, there's an 80 to 100% probability that we're going to get a contested election and that it's going to be, you know, a, a three to 5% move when it happens. So they just, the ball got priced too high. Um, we should come up with a, uh, a new Greek for that. Like, Paula or something <laughs> is the I, <laughs> the amount yeah, of Paula increases every day the election doesn't get settled. We'll, we'll call it the 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 jam. The jam, the jam or sun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like well, uh, so anyway, but uh, but so that's that's kind of what happened. Uh, the uh, it has come back in the line quite a bit. There's still an opportunity out there um, in in this where you can um, you know get short kind of some uh, dec. Uh, these are Jan, um, you know, Vol, and I won't get too discreet about where I'm doing it or how, and you can be long some no, which is two and a half weeks after the election for relatively cheap. And yeah. you can do it in a way where you also get some convexity and VIX calls, right? And hedge and you have convexity and your flat gamma and flat vega and uh, really kind of taking out a big, like extra little bit of edge uh, with, you know, a good, really good risk reward position. And, and in the 80% plus chance that, that it's resolved by November, you make a lot of money, uh, and the chance the market goes down and is stressful between now and then, you're you're fairly hedged, and you can you know you can move things around as necessary, and there's a good chance implied volatility will decrease regardless during that time. In my opinion, I can get into why I think that, but uh, you know, it really Holiday. set yourself for a really nice risk reward, exactly among other things, and then so you get yourself into a nice risk reward position, and, and that's kind of what we set ourselves up to do. Yeah, just to me, it was I'd never considered right you know everyone knows about the electoral college but i never knew when they actually vote right just, summer 14th yeah right so now it became like an event a risk new event. Top of an event risk yep that's exactly right but but again i think you have to realize that a lot of information will you know come out between now and then and, and look i've been through enough of these events i've been through brexit i've been through you know you know uh, y2k i've been I've been through the you know, the Trump election. You know, I could go on and on, but the, those those first, the, you know, the Trump. Uh, Why two K? That was. Uh, I know. <laughs> big I know. nothing burger. I, I know. <laughs> exactly, but that, they almost all are right. Like yeah. even the ones that are. So you have two kinds of that. You have the kind that where nothing really happens, right? And it's a massive sale. That's the easy one, right? But then you also have the one where the the most unexpected thing happens, like the Trump election, like Brexit, right? Yeah. Those were incredibly unexpected events. And they all resolve in a similar way. Now, there's no guarantee that this will happen. But again, back to flows and positioning, which is what really matters in terms of the probability of outcomes. If we get a contested election at this point, is anybody really going to be surprised? Yeah, no, it's become an, is the expected outcome. Yeah, Correct. I mean, it's not going to be a huge shock to the system. It's not like a black swan that comes out of nowhere, right? 
Two, people are hedged because they're scared. That implied ball is high because people are like afraid. Yeah. So what happens when the event happens? These people are along this hedge and then you go down. What do they have to do? They got to monetize that hedge. They got to do it quick. Right. But it, and so what it, happens it, in these the flip side of that is like, like, hey, we're calling in the tanks to suppress Illinois or something, right? Like anything can happen. Nothing yeah. is risk free. I'm not sitting here saying like, hey, yeah. just go sell ball and all of that <laughs> always like you'll, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Like, no, don't worry no, about the tank. Yeah. Right. But my point is there are ways to put on good relative value trades. Yeah, uh, relative the, whole risk game. the whole game. Asymmetric. Right. And, and generally the. You know, broadly, those events tend to be overvalued. And if you can do it in a way that you know, you're relatively protected, you're going to win eight, nine out of 10 of those. And, and uh, you know, that's the, when these things come around, they're big opportunities uh, for people who kind of get what's going on. But there's a feedback loop. And we talked about Vana and Charm, when you have a really high implied volatility for an event and the event happens, regardless of the outcome, that ball has to decline. Like the information is out. The thing happened. Vol declines. What happens when vol declines? People are short put. The dealers are short put, long call. Same thing, right? Well, I All think every first time option traders experience that, right? Of like buying a, a call into earnings and it beats earnings and the call price comes down. You're like, what? Correct. You know the Trump election was a great example. Market went down 5% overnight, right? That's kind of the gamma effect, right? But then all these people who are long vol, right? Market opens, they got to monetize that vol and vol yeah, got boom. compressed. And the second ball comes from like a really high level to a low level all at once. The, the flood of stock buyback that has to happen in order to kind of monetize this is, is yeah. huge. huge. And so it, there's a natural underpinning reflexivity that actually tends to make these events, you know, non-events. If it's an expected event, it tends not to be an event. Um, and, and so again, you never know. I'm not saying like, again, full disclosure, don't, don't come sue me if you sell ball. I'm not telling you to sell ball, right? Like, uh, Jim uh, said, there'd be no tanks. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, but that's the, that's the broad concept. And, 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 you know, so this is working, this works for you on lots of different levels. And it's a really uh, kind of, um, you know, cute little trade and opportunity. And then they don't come around that often. So when they yeah, do, no, and I think it's a good answer. insight into how your brain works and how you structure the trades as well. Let's finish up with uh, some quick fire questions here. Um, you ready? Yep. Sure. Favorite jam. Favorite jam, strawberry. Strawberry. Love it. Uh, <laughs> mine as well. My sister just got, I had to email her the other day. I'm like, stop. She did a homemade jelly of the month thing for last Christmas. So I've been getting them like every month. I'm kind of low carb. I'm like, stop sending me sugar jellies, please. So, so we used to go to Turkey every summer. My grandmother used to make her own jam. She'd sit out in the sun, like on the windowsill, like oh, yeah. five different containers. So <laughs> jam is very dear to my heart. All right. Favorite favorite croissant? Croissant. I didn't know there were different kinds. The, yeah, we can the, get the, the almond the, one, the chocolate. Oh, oh yeah. Ham and oh, cheese. Oh. Yeah. Pond chocolate. I don't know if you can call that uh, croissant, yeah. but definitely. All right. Pond. Done. Yeah, pond chocolate. Um, favorite city you've lived in it's been a while you got oh, yeah i mean istanbul istanbul Istanbul's the coolest coolest city on the planet if you haven't been you gotta go i haven't been just the, just the history the the mix of people uh it's it's a crossroads so you know of history and of, of culture yeah. it's amazing yeah all right put it on the list um Fave, now you say you're a biking as a hobby. What what kind of biking? Road cycle? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't want to overstate it. Like, uh, it, you know, it's not like I'm out uh, mountain biking every weekend. But uh, you know, I, I love biking with my kids. I bike to work every day. Um, go. It's a good way to kind of get exercise and your you know, own bike. Or as long as the weather. No, my own bike. My own bike. Yeah. No, I you know, and I and I like to kind of haul a little bit. You know, when I when I'm out there, just try and try and beat uh beat all the traffic. Are you a in, so no, Tour de France I, I, watcher? Uh, I sure, yeah. I mean, it's not necessarily my uh, my my first sport, but I love I love biking in general, and definitely uh, competitive biking is pretty cool. Favorite Tour de France rider? Got one. Le Mans. Le Mans Greg Le Mans. All right. Greg Le Mans, baby. Um, I would go uh, Julian Alaphilippe. You French can't say Lance Armstrong anymore. You, you... I know. <laughs> he, he was great. Um. What, so Constantinople, Istanbul, yes. can I call it Constantinople? 
Sure. Uh, favorite, if I go, favorite tourist thing to do there? Uh, favorite tourist thing to do? Uh, I mean, the Hagia Sophia, it's, it's kind of, you can't, uh, you can't overstate it. It's, uh, you know, it was a, a temple, then a church, then a mosque, then a church, then a mosque again. And the layers of history, they just peel away. You know, the, it, you know, this was created in 400 BC. Yeah, I mean, we're talking 2,600 years of history. Wow. Um, and it's still standing. It's an amazing structure that's just mind-bending to think of that they built it when they did and that it's still kind of um, standing and, and just just seeing history kind of. That whole area, uh, you know, around the, the, the Golden Horn, uh, which is kind of the original, um, you know, Constantinople is just, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an outdoor museum. It's amazing. Yeah, we uh, we put that song on the pod once for uh, Jason Buck. I think he worked in a Istanbul rug market or something. And when he mentioned, there, there might be giants, right? Yeah, there might be Istanbul. giants. Maybe we'll throw it in here as well. Istanbul, Constantinople. Now it's Istanbul. Go, go uh, I love that song. And last one, we ask all our guests' favorite Star Wars character. Oh, uh, Boba Fett. Boba Fett. I love it. <laughs> uh, not Django, Boba, the original. The original. Yeah, he was the coolest at the time. I used to have like the Millennium Falcon. I probably had like 200 Star Wars. I was a huge Star Wars kid. Oh, yeah. Our uh, our guy who does the audio on this pod has a his work from home. When we're on the Zoom, he's got all his old Star Wars characters in a frame behind his Zoom thing. I just, <laughs> it's the best. I went to uh, prep school and I came home uh, one one day, like a year in, and my mom had donated all my Star Wars stuff to yeah. a friend of a friend of the family. But like, I could never. I, like, it was a huge. No. I still don't. I still don't really forgive her. <laughs> <laughs> I had a similar thing happen. It's the worst. All right, Jim. Well, thanks so much. It's been fun. Um, Absolutely. Look thanks forward for to seeing me. you in person around Chicago, and we're back back in action. Would love to. Thanks for having After me, buddy. The corona. All right. Take care. You've been listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at RCM Alts and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalts.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you.